Hello, I'm Christine. Welcome to Book Talk. Today we are discussing The Trials of Apollo by Rick Riordan. I finished it. I read it. I did it. And I'm just so excited about the it. The feeling of elation when I got to that last page and closed the book was amazing. Because I started reading it forever ago. So if you don't know, Trials of Apollo is the first book in Rick's new series, The Trials of Apollo. This is the Hidden Oracle, book one. I believe there's going to be five books. And I believe in some way, shape, or form this series is going to intersect with this series. And I'm excited for it. I've read all the Percy related Rick Riordan books now and I feel so accomplished. Like it's been so long since I've been to Camp half Blood, and I loved being there again. I missed it so much. So those of you who haven't read Trials of Apollo yet, pitched to us as like it's in Percy's world. And I was led to believe that this book was going to be a Percy filled book. Which it wasn't. Which is why I, I put it down 50 pages in when I started. It had more Percy than The Lost Hero does. But not enough Percy for my liking. But as the book went on, of course, things got interesting. And I grew to like everyone else. And it was great. Percy's there for, I want to say, like one eighth of the book. But the fact that he's there and he's accessible is great. Also, as you go on, we see more and more familiar faces. And it's so exciting every time we see one. It's like, oh, I did. I, uh -huh. Hi! I'd give Trials of Apollo 94%. It reminded me of the Percy Jackson the Olympian series. It's in first person. You see from Apollo's point of view, Apollo has been smited into mortal form by Zeus for his misgivings, and he has to perform a series of trials to prove himself worthy of being a god again. I'm just perpetually impressed by how Rick takes these different mythologies and modernizes them in these stories and makes them so accessible and funny and brilliant. I just, he's so good at it. That's about all I can say in this non-spoilery section. So if you haven't read it yet, I'm going to ask you to leave. You should go read it. Bye-bye, non-spoilery folk. Bye-bye. 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 Okay. At the beginning of Trials of Apollo, I was very amused by his blatant godly statements. You may not fall to my athletics, but my golden singing voice shall surely get you. The singing thing. Like, I was not expecting these singing powers. When Apollo sings, he lulls everyone around him into this crippling emotional state where they can do nothing but cry or fall over or succumb to the feelings he's emitting through the song. I found that to be a lot of fun. It annoyed me to no end, though, when he was like, like, I swear on the river sticks that I will not pick up a bow or pick up a ukulele until I'm a god again. Those are still your strengths. You can't just regard the things you're good at because what are you going to use against the monsters, Apollo? What? How are you going to fix this? Like, you can understand what he's feeling. Say you were a gymnast when you were in high school, okay? And now you're in your 20s. You're still good at it, but it's not the same. These things happen. And Apollo hasn't really had to deal with it. When is that going to come back to bite us in the ass? When is the river sticks curse going to come back? The double Double River Six curse. Ugh. The good thing is that he has now garnered a favor from the geyser god, Polly. <laughs> Right off the bat, I liked Apollo just because I like the things he stands for. I felt that I would be in Apollo's house. While at first I got annoyed by him, I feel like it really gained a new understanding of him as a person. I love that in human form, Apollo was forced to really take a step back and see himself in a new light. He's kind of having this crisis of heart, trying to come to terms with this person that he used to be or still is as a god. It's both really great and heartbreaking to hear him talk about how disappointed he is about how he can't commit to anything. Like, he could never commit to a partner. He doesn't have a significant other. He's completely screwed up any relationship he's had with someone he really, really cared about. And this is reflected in other parts of his life, too. And just him as a god. He couldn't commit to one thing. He's the god of so many different things. Medicine, poetry, music, archery. These are such different paths. Which is why Apollo as a god is sometimes so confusing. It's like, wait, what is he the god of? And it's like this array of five different different irrelevant things. He's the head of so many different things that he can't excel to the fullest in one thing. But that's also like why I kind of feel a kinship with the god of Apollo because creative artsy people tend to want to do a lot of different things and, and I consider him kind of the creative god, like the artsy god. He loves poetry and music and performing and like that's his power. Anytime I read something in this Greek world, I'm instantly comparing all the characters to Percy. We meet the demigod lead and it's Meg, and immediately I'm like, what? This is like a five-year-old girl! She's nowhere near 
Percy's skill level. No! And again, just like with Apollo, Meg started to grow on me. I felt her betrayal so hard. It crossed my mind when it was mentioned that there was a demigod working for the beast at Camp Half-Blood, but like, no, it's, I couldn't believe that it was Meg. She's definitely on our side. When I read that line late last night, I put down the book and just stared into space for a good minute because what the f that heart, Meg. It really, really did. I love learning and I learned so much stuff. Random things that I would never know reading Rick's book. All this stuff about Emperor Nero. Yeah, I learned that at one point, but that wasn't something that stuck in my brain, you know? Like I vaguely remember this emperor that let Rome burn, but I don't remember who it was. I don't remember what he did or what he stood for. But the fact that Nero built a colossal statue of himself and put it in one of the gladiator arenas. And that is why that arena became known as the Col Coliseum blew my mind. Uh, we have this whole situation at Camp Half Blood. Communications are all down. Iris messages aren't going through. Cell phones aren't working. Things are a mess. And students are disappearing into the Camp Half Blood woods. And we soon figure out that this is because the Forest of Dodona, which is an oracle, ancient prophecy telling forest, has relocated itself into the woods around Camp Half Blood. There are five oracles, and all the other four have been taken by these ancient Roman emperors, which I just didn't see that one coming. There's this conglomerate called the Triumvirate Holdings that has been funding every bad thing that has happened to our demigods since Percy Jackson in the Olympian series. And these are regular emperors that have kept themselves alive by turning themselves into gods, making shrines and such to themselves. The gods are alive because of how culture regards them. And because so many people know the names of these old emperors, they are kind of solidified in life in some way. <laughs> I love the line about Wikipedia. Emperor Nero? In one time period, he was but a shadow, barely a ghost, because no one knew his name anymore. But now with Wikipedia, he's immortalized forever on the internet. Oh, good stuff. So big picture for Apollo right now, the Oracle of Delphi has been captured by Pythinius or Python, who's his arch nemesis. And he's going to ultimately have to defeat him again to take back Delphi. But before he can do that, he has to take back all the other oracles to lessen the power of the three Roman imperators. Because without oracles, there are no prophecies. And without prophecies, we can't defeat them. Prophecies do more than just prophesize the future. They instigate the future. They propel it forward. With all this magic and hubbub and stuff, you really need that line. You really need that push from the oracle to get you in the right direction. We get to Camp Half-Blood and Will is here. Like we see Will in the Apollo cabin and I immediately get so excited. And then we see Nico and Will and Nico are together and they're so cute. I love that we got to see them interacting and bickering and being cute. And they were so happy. Oh my God, I love when they're in the cafeteria and Nico sits at the Apollo table where he's not really supposed to be, but it's okay because he has a doctor's note. If he sits anywhere else, scary shit happens with the ground cracking open zombies. It's just a mess. He's got to sit with Will. And then at the end, it was just like the perfect return to that joke. Apollo's like, Will, Kayla, come with me. And Nico follows behind them. Me too. I have a doctor's note. <laughs> Let's talk about Meg for a second. So right off the bat, I could not come up with who her godly parent would be. I don't know why Demeter just like completely slipped my mind. I was like, is she Pan's daughter? In the uh, Percy Jackson, the Olympian series, we were like constantly looking for Pan, I feel like. Maybe that's just because Grover was obsessed with him. I feel like we heard so much about him. So Pan was the person in my mind. I was like, daughter of Pan? I thought Pan was missing for centuries or something. Then it wasn't until like, I don't know, a few pages before that Demeter popped into my brain. I was like, De Demeter. And it was really interesting because we don't really know any daughters of Demeter and her powers are really cool and weird. The first time we get in a tussle, Meg's rings turn into these magical Roman swords. What the f I was so suspicious in that moment, but I don't know. I just like let it slide by after that. And she says that she got him from her stepfather. I was like, oh, is her stepfather a demigod? At first, I was also really taken back by Peach. I was like, must we have this Peach demon following us around? But then he grew on me too. He's like some Percy Jackson equivalent of Groot. Peaches. Everything just takes some getting used to in this new non-Percy-centric book. I have my heart set on Percy being the demigod that's gonna help a 
Apollo accomplished these trials. And you know what? We're getting someone pretty good. Like, I was so excited when they finally got into the forest of Dodonna, got those chimes hung up, and the prophecy came out. I knew, I knew immediately that it was gonna be Leo. And I was so happy. I was so excited. I love Leo. I had tears in my eyes when Leo returned to the camp. It's gonna be so interesting to see how everything's changed with Calypso and to have Calypso with us on that journey without her powers and she's mortal now. And who knows, like maybe by the time we're actually defeating Python, Percy will have joined our crew. I love how they talk about the famous demigods. Apollo's always scanning the camp like, where are all the cool demigods? Like where's Jason and Pipper and Frank and Hazel? Like where they at? Poor you, you're gonna have to settle for the lesser known demis. I love at the end when Percy shows up and we lose our chariot. Apollo's like, where's that flying boy, Jason Grace? And Percy's just like, yeah, we're fresh out of flying boys. Apollo, it wouldn't have worked out. Like, let's be honest, he would have been smacked in the face by the giant robot and fell into the lake and drowned. And that would have distracted Percy. He would have to go save him. We would have just been worse off. We would have been worse off with him there. Okay, you're lucky. You're lucky it was Percy, not Jason. I think the funniest line for me was when Apollo and Meg are going off to find the forest of Dodona. They're gathering weapons. And Apollo won't take the goddamn bow. And Will comes up to him and gives him this special weaponized ukulele. And Apollo begrudgingly puts it around his back. It's me girl gives Meg this little bag of seeds <laughs> and Apollo's like it's reassuring to know in the event that we're attacked I can hit them on the head with my ukulele and Meg can plant geraniums <laughs> There's so many flower jokes because so many of Apollo's long lost loves have turned into plants or flowers. In that part with the ants where he's trying to rescue Meg and she's stuck in the goop and all they have are those seeds. Meg's like, throw them all on top of me. And Apollo's like, no, I won't do it. Too many people I care about have turned into flowers. Oh my god, and don't even get me started on that whole scene with the Ant Queen. Apollo creates this ode to the Ant Queen, and she's so moved by it at the end that she like adopts them, and she lets them go. And Apollo goes up to her, may I call you mama? What are you doing? Must we befriend the giant ant? The whole scene, once we get to the gates, was so much darker than I was expecting it to. Like, these kids are strung up. Like, Apollo compares it to being crucified. Okay, they're up on these big poles, covered in this web-like substance, ready to be burnt alive. But this guy ain't fooling around. The relationship that we come to see with Meg and Nero and the beast was so troubling and sad. Nero has been gaslighting her entire life story, just projecting these things things that he wants her to believe and she's been taking them in because she's a child, she's young, he's taking care of her, like why would he be lying to her? And it's so sad that even after watching this whole thing go down, Meg believes that he wouldn't have burned down the forest. You know, like this guy is a pyromaniac! His entire history is about how he let Rome burn to the ground. Thousands of his people died while he watched, but all he was thinking about was like, with these people gone, he can rebuild whatever the hell he wants over where they used to be. Literally the same thing is happening now with New York. He's a narcissistic, abusive asswipe, and I can't wait to see him die. We're left with a few mysterious questions, so the forest of Dodonna, after it gives us the prophecy, it also also throws us an arrow, a magic talking arrow. Oh, I love the little section where Apollo's like, oh, fudge. This thing is talking to me. I try to avoid talking weapons whenever possible. And then he makes a reference, I'm pretty sure it's to Frey. Apollo's arrow doesn't want to be shot. It's there to just give advice. And it talks in this Shakespearean voice. And I love it. Like, I gotta say, I very much enjoy talking weapons. It's reassuring that we'll have this kind of constant background voice of advice with Apollo. Because I'm sure he'll be taking that arrow with him. And it's part of the prophecy forest, so it knows things. And then we've also got the question of Apollo. Apollo's strength. His godly strength or demigod worthy strength comes to him in these times of need. Like he was able to spell the arrow into a plague arrow and he was able to pull those beams from the ground to save his children. The question is, is that daddy upstairs being like, oh shit, I don't want him to die and he's being heroic like he needs the strength. Zip, he can have the strength for 10 minutes. Or is that something that Apollo has to tap into himself and if he figures out how to use it, he can use it to his advantage whenever he needs it. Like, I'm thinking it's daddy upstairs. It feels like Olympus has its eyes on 
you. They're watching because something is up. Something's going down. I'm so excited to go on our quest. We're gonna be leaving Camp Half-Blood on Festus. I think the banter between Apollo and Leo is gonna be great. I can't wait to find out if these two series are gonna collide because we've got Annabeth up in here because Magnus is her cousin. It has to happen. The question is, are these two gonna play out and then there's gonna be a new series where we're colliding and we have to work together or are they going to intersect sometime within the course of these series themselves? Because we've only got one book left in Magnus Chase. We've got, I think, I'm pretty sure this is five books. We've got four more Apollo books coming, so who knows? I am pumped to see what Rick has in store for us. I wonder if we're gonna bring Meg on this journey with us because we don't exactly have a seat for her on Festus. It's a three-seater. But if she does come, I think Calypso would stay behind. She's human and she's gonna be a liability. We can't feed her the magic goop to make her better. She's not like a god slash human where we think that the gods will intervene and not let Apollo die. Like, I honestly think Apollo wouldn't be let to die if he was going to die. Like, Artemis would swoop in and save him or daddy would come down. Like, they don't want to kill him. They want him to prove himself to be a god again. You know, honestly, I don't think we could leave Meg in the hands of Nero for that long of a time. So I think Apollo would have to go see her before they left with Festus. And if Apollo wasn't gonna do it, I think we'd have to send Percy to do it. Someone would have to do it. The good thing about having read this a year late is that we're so close to the release of book two. I'm Christine. Please share your thoughts and feelings on all the new characters and the hidden oracle in general. I'm Christine. I make videos every Tuesday. I have a video for every other Percy Jackson related book that exists. So you can check those out if you haven't yet. Maddox seen me on Twitter and Instagram. I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.